We're um, going to talk to you some more about teaching mapping to geographers um, based on some work that Alan has done historically or previously and some work that I've done very recently at San Francisco State. So to be specific about who we mean, who are these geographers exactly that we mean? Are they students? Are they faculty? What are they? Well, we mean students going about teaching students and specifically mostly our, our case study is students at San Francisco State University. Um, it's a relatively diverse student body um, and it, uh, within the geography department at, um, at San Francisco State there's not a lot of awareness of OpenStreetMap at all. Um, for me I'm adjunct faculty there so coming in I'm teaching a cartography class and um, when I was at um, State of the Map last year, there wasn't even the beginning of the thought that I might be teaching this class. Um, but when I was hired to teach cartography to my students, um, including OSM in my curriculum was a no-brainer. But um, there were a lot of challenges, and, and I did have to make a lot of interesting decisions. And so I just wanted to share that process with all of you. Um, so why did we think it was interesting or important to talk specifically about teaching OpenStreetMap to geographers? Um, because geography and OSM, um, well, traditional geography uh, curriculums include GIS and remote sensing and all of these sorts of sciences that um, run in parallel to OSM. Um, OSM has come up with alternative solutions that are that there isn't that there historically hasn't been a lot of awareness, and so. Um, it's 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 almost it's both. Um, a lot of the students have an existing paradigm that they're working with, um, but it's hard in some ways to relate. It's pretty. It can be pretty abstract to try and relate those paradigms to OpenStreetMap. Um, there are a lot of confusions and mistakes that can happen. Um, in a way, the fact that they have a little bit of knowledge is a double-edged sword. It's great because right already the, the students that you can you can presuppose they have an interest in this sort of stuff, mapping, etc. They're taking a cartography class, they're majors in geography, but at the same time they have these existing structures in their brains um, that have been that, that have been sort of received as as given from an entire faculty. And here I am coming in and saying, oh here's this other thing that's, you know, community based on IRC chats and collaborative coding models. Never mind all of that, but here you go, you know, do this. So there are some substantial challenges to all of those things. So how do you explain OSM to geographers? I, I, I asked Alan Funky what he thought. Yeah, uh, so, so I, before we even try to do anything hands-on with the students, um, I came in and did a guest lecture in Stephanie's class to try to explain what OSM is in the context that these geography students would understand. Um, because you would explain it differently to them than you would to another kind of newbie. First thing to get across is, of course, it's a data project. Um, it's not a map. It's really a database. And that's something that's true you, that I find I have to explain to almost anybody who I start talking about what OpenStreetMap is. Uh, but with these geography students, you, I show them just the different map layers that are available. So these are all coming from the same database. We all in this room know that kind of thing. But then once you start showing this to a geography student who's been working with GIS, they think, oh, layers, are those data layers? Can I turn parts of those on and off? Well, it's not a GIS either. Um, a lot of the students will think, can I use this as a replacement for ArcGIS? Can I start loading my data in? Can I um, load my contour data into OpenStreetMap, and we can say it's not quite like that. Um, our data model is, of course, different from what is taught in geography classes, um, or geometry classes even. Uh, they're familiar with points, lines, and polygons. And even though we've, we have this growing trend within OpenStreetMap to try to ab abstract away the notion that we don't have an area type, um, the ID editor shows, yes, you can edit areas. And if you download OpenStreetMap data as a shapefile, you can get it in areas. But um, I find if you're actually talking to geography students, it's useful to tell them that, well, it's actually stored differently. And there's historical reasons why. And there's this thing called relations instead of um, tables of, of uh, other kinds of connections between your data. Um, 
it helps them think more critically about why data is stored in a certain way, and it's not just um, the way that ArcGIS does it is therefore the right way to do it. Um, and also, I would not really get into QA tools when I'm explaining OpenStreetMap to other newbies. But when we're struggling against, as Stephanie said, a lot of maybe other geography professors who will be telling the students that OSM is unreliable or it's made by amateurs so you can't trust it and so on, um, I like to show them, well, how does OpenStreetMap maintain this quality? There's tons of different types of great visualizations to show you, say, buildings that don't have names on them and so on. Um, and I think the students can handle it, even though these get to be pretty intense. But it also lets you start talking about the complexity of the data. You know, once you start explaining that there, there is different types of street intersections and so on in these QA tools, um, it's, it's a potential that they can understand what's going on more, um, in more detail, even if I'm not really expecting to, to use those tools. And the same thing is with the Tiger data. Like the Tiger QA tools are like um, the battle grid are great to give students tasks to work on, but it also thinking about the, the fact that a lot of Tiger data has not been reviewed, a lot of the old Tiger data in OSM is old and kind of bad, makes them think, well, all of this data that I've been getting in my other GIS courses that I'm assuming is perfect is actually flawed in its own ways and is still made by humans, just different ones than OpenStreetMap. And something like this showing the Tiger reviewed map um, showing East Oakland has not been reviewed. Then you can start to talk about the community aspects and the social aspects of which parts of OSM have more activity and less activity. Um, and, and finally, talking about Tiger gets you to start talking about licenses. So what does it mean that Tiger is public domain and OpenStreetMap is different? Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that here, and I try not to talk about it too much to the students, but it's important to get at that um, at some point in your introduction of OSM to the students. So those are just some highlights of how I tried to prep them, and then Stephanie's going to talk about how we actually went into the lab assignment. Sure. So, right, so that was our, exist our, our, our framework when we approached these students. Um, in actual fact, oh, there, what I encountered when I began getting to know these students as the course progressed um, through other, um, teaching them other aspects of um, cartography was that there was just an incredible diversity of what, what um, experience and knowledge they had, what internships they had had previously, um, whether they had a lot of experience digitizing or had never heard the word digitized before, um, whether they'd taken a GIS class or were just taking cartography because someone told them that it was going to be easy. Um, <laughs> um, so what, what I ended up doing, in fact, when it came down to writing the curriculum around OpenStreetMap and writing the lab specifically, um, is that um, I went for sort of the, I, I, I took a pretty specific approach. I wanted everything to be hands-on and I wanted everything to be relatable and I wanted everything to be very inclusive. Um, so here's a picture, this over here on the right is my co-teacher Damon. We taught the class together um, and these are some of my students and that's our classroom. Um, I decided that we would start with a place that we all had in common, which is the campus of San Francisco State. Um, the campus was partially mapped. Um, the roads were there, a few buildings, but not all of the buildings. So it seemed like a very manageable project and one that um, was at the right scale for introducing these students and one that you know was a little easier on me because their edits were all in the same place. Um, didn't teach them, teach them JOSM because again, I was dealing with a pretty diverse um, set of skill levels. Um, so just as the last speaker said, um, ID was really a lifesaver. Um, it's it's um, because it sort of masks some of the complexities of the internal data structure that um, Alan was talking about, and just sort of gives the students points, lines, and polygons to work with, which is what the closer to the model of what they're used to anyway. Um, it's it's much easier for them to sort of get right into it and um, not trip out quite so much. Um, so there's a little ID action going on with the, in, the, in the midst of digitizing the San Francisco State campus. Um, 
Another thing I did was uh, um, emphasize the importance of ground truthing, right? That's the other big advantage of mapping close to home is that they knew the campus well, they could go out and check their work. And to do that, we used um, field papers, which has been developed by, or, or is, is maintained by Stamen. Um, uh, for, for anyone who hasn't heard of it, it allows you to go and snapshot um, an area of the map and print out a paper map and go out and annotate that map and then bring it back and photograph or scan it um, and then the map is automatically projected um, so that you can just digitize from that paper map that you had in the field. Uh, it's quite slick. Finally, I thought it was really important to find some way to introduce them to the OSM community um, because I think that community and discussions are such an important part of um, OpenStreetMap. Um, and, and this is challenging, right, because there's all sorts of community norms, and as I said before, these students have no context for understanding many of those um, norms and where they come from. Um, but the way that I chose to do that was by assigning them um, to um, talk about what they had contributed um, through the osm.org diary function. Um, and more on that later. Um, and then last but not least, um, we encourage them to go further um, by using humanitarian OpenStreetMap to contribute to the mapping efforts in the Central African Republic that were going on a month or so ago. Um, and many of them did. Um, do the, uh, participate in this. This was largely extra credit. Um, showed them a video in class to give them some visual context and then um, explained a bit, a bit about uh, what humanitarian OpenStreetMap was and so, so just gave them that further exposure. Um, I, felt like, I felt that it was really important also that they, especially because it's a cartography class, that we pull out the data that they had created um, and work with it a little bit um, and that actually turned out to be very valuable. So I gave them some instructions about um, extracting to shape files because that's the format that they're most familiar with um, and working with things from there. So results. This is the campus before we began mapping and that's the campus after. So you can see that we added a significant amount of buildings and walking trails. Um, some refinements of the um, of, of, of the stadium and some of the other buildings, um, and you can't see there are a, a, a number of other attributes that students chose to map as um, various types of point attributes that are not rendered in the default OSM base map. But um, it really was a pretty substantial change. Um, Alan's going to talk about some specific examples of what <laughs> students mapped. Yeah, so, so here you can see the result of some of those field paper scans. So they were out there in the field hand annotating these pieces of paper and they scan right back in and they can trace these in ID. Uh, this one we see there's, they're noting that there's a grassy area and a soccer field that was not shown in the data. They're adding a bike rack next to that. Um, here you can, also, you can also print out a satellite version of field papers. So you can't really see too well on the screen, but there's a bunch of little black dots everywhere. So this student decided to map all of the uh, waste baskets they could find outside on the pathways. Here's a bit more detail. This is um, that grassy field and the soccer, um, soccer pitch were buildings actually on the satellite version of this map. So those buildings have been demolished recently and they're still there on the, on, um, the satellite and they're still there on a lot of other maps. So they had to go out there and, and note roughly where the edge of the grassy area was and where the edge of the sports field was because um, they didn't have a satellite image to guide them. So here on the ground knowledge really made a difference. And more recycling bins. Um, along the edge, the, there's, the student was estimating the distance that they walked. You can't quite see it's propped off at the end. Um, so some surveying attempt there as well. And here are some shots of uh, the Edo World's OSM mapper showing the different users who have contributed in the SFSU uh, campus area. So the, the top user, Kindred Coda, I don't know who that is, but they, looking at their history, they're a longtime OSM contributor. Second top user is Jay Fire, some of you may know this guy, John Firebaugh, um, who also was there helping in person when the students were editing. Uh, but 
number three on down, um, most of those are students from this class who are now in, in the top ranked mappers in this area. And just looking at a few of them um, selected out, some of them really sp decided to specialize in buildings, some looked at trails, um, this one did a variety of different things, or they looked at different parts of campus. So it was a lot of informal divvying up the territory, but yeah, the tasking manager would, could have helped a lot in this case. So what did the students say in their diary entries? If you subscribe by RSS feed to um, the diary entries on um, OpenStreetMap.org, I'm sorry if it was annoying. <laughs> um, but they did have some things to say, and they were interesting things, a lot of them. Um, a couple of students shared this sentiment, which was uh, something along the lines of, I've been, um, I've been digitizing things in um, ArcGIS for years, and I never knew about OpenStreetMap. This is awesome. This is incredible, um, beca largely because they can trace it and then they can see it in a usable form right there immediately and it doesn't just sort of disappearing off into some data set that they're never gonna see again. Um, other students had sentiments I think that many um, new time um, OpenStreetMap users have where they find a blank space in the map and they fill it in and that now they feel a tremendous sense of contribution and ownership um, to OpenStreetMap. Um, some students really responded to the humanitarian OpenStreetMap tasks, um, and a student in particular has, said, has, has made a pledge that he's going to participate in future human disasters um, because that really uh, spoke to him. Um, a lot of students, I think, felt a great sense of accomplishment just generally by sort of the collaborative process of um, creating this map. Um, although some of them, as, as Alan said, I think, um, Listening to the previous talk, they're much more sophisticated than, than we were in this effort. We were just sort of like casting something out there to see what worked, but um, we learned a lot. But I think in future, um, one thing that was a major challenge was that if you're just using ID and you haven't done a lot of divvying up before, it's very easy for students to end up editing the same um, feature. And that can be very frustrating for them because they don't get to save their edits and they get confused about why. And um, so that was a bit of a learning uh, process. Um, as, as, as many um, regular contributors to OpenStreetMap um, uh, do, maybe they don't advertise it, but they do, um, our, our students uh, sometimes uh, chose to add the features that were particularly important to them um, and then told us about it. There was a big discussion about how this smoking area should be tagged. And, um, how was it tagged? Uh, you, uh, you, you tell me, I don't remember. <laughs> um, but also it did pan, the, the idea, that the, the notion that these students would have some local knowledge that would be valuable and contribute to the map um, did definitely pan out. Um, for instance, this was an ATM station that was previously on the map and we were able to delete it. Uh, we deleted a number of sort of ge random geo names tags for buildings that had been demolished previously and uh, things like that. Um, one student was particularly frustrated um, and, and, and voiced her frustration in this way, which was because she had this great plan. She wanted to map all the water refill stations on campus and somebody beat her to it. And it was her plan and she expressed it as, I, I bet this happens a lot in OpenStreetMap when you have a plan. And I'm sure, I think that it does if you're mapping quite intensively. Um, it's, a, it's a race to see who gets to certain things first. Um, one fantastic thing um, from my perspective um, about having them write these diary entries uh, was that uh, the ones that were particularly engaging got responses from people who read them and who you know uh, read, uh, um, re make a regular habit of reading um, other contributors' diary entries. And some of those comments were really, really great. Um, a lot of people, when people would gripe about some feature of ID that they just didn't think was precise enough based on their experience digitizing in such and such place, um, they got immediate responses about using JOSM, even about using the, um, the ArcGIS plugin tool, um, and those were really great. Some of them are really detailed about exactly how to do it and exactly what to do, and that was really fantastic to see. Um, 
There were a few students, this was a very common problem. It was very hard, to, this is, I think, it, it, very hard to communicate with students who didn't have any experience with some idea of data creation. It was very hard to communicate with them the difference between tagging something with a category and using the name to just say what it is. Um, and so that was a problem. Um, other contributors picked up on that right away and, and um, commented to, to the students that you know, they should you know, really modify the way in which they were tagging things um, for those couple of times that it did happen. Um, and I was very proud of this comment because I did try my very, very best to explain to them the importance of um, commenting on what changes that they had made so that someone else looking at their changes would understand um, what was going on. This, however, was my favorite favorite comment of all, where someone is giving really constructive advice um, in response to the particular challenge that the student was just um, talking about and how to classify a covered parking structure, but then said, no pressure. Here's a way to do it, no pressure. <laughs> um, I, I do have to acknowledge, though, that um, I think that um, my use of diary, well, I know that my use of diary entries um, for this purpose um, was a little bit jarring for some people. Um, an administrator of the, I had an interaction with the, an administrator of the open street, um, of OpenStreetMap.org um, because one of my students um, had kind of done a pretty lackluster job of the diary part of the assignment. Um, and he used the spam function on it to block the diary entry, so we didn't really know what was going on. Um, and um, so we had an email back and forth, and um, you know, he said to me, and it's not a totally illegitimate statement, um, I'm, I, I, based on how diary entries are generally used, that he's not convinced that diary pages are an appropriate place for, for coursework submission. Um, so um, that may be true. But it is, I will say that it is very challenging to know where is an appropriate place to sort of try and introduce students to sort of a broader community rather than just having to rely on me and Alan and whoever else I can pull in to help these students out. Um, no, no, it was much longer. It was a several, involved several emails. <laughs> but that, 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 I think, is the crux of his objection. And back and forth. Yes, back and forth, yeah. I mean, it wasn't a terrible discussion. He unblocked them. It was all right. <laughs> um, so this class is still ongoing. I'm, I'm, I'm here this week, but I'll go back and teach some more. On Thursday, uh, they will turn in their interactive web maps based on the data that we pulled down um, that they digitized. Um, um, they've created inter interactive web maps of the San Francisco State Campus. This right now is the web map um, available to all of us. Um, it's tiled, it has five tiles, um, one big one, and then you zoom in, there's four small ones, and you can use a little magnifying glass on your browser to move around. Um, so I feel like my students can probably provide something better than this, and maybe even move the needle a little bit on convincing the San Francisco State grounds uh, people that it's worth maintaining a slightly more complex, uh, maintaining their data in a way that's unfamiliar to them, i.e. in an in interactive way. Um, I will also say that in the recent week, um, there's been a new dawning of understanding as they've begun working with this data, as they've pulled it down and seen like, ah, I see how, how you know, this, this strange tagging scheme that I had came across when I actually download this data and try and work with it. And ah, oh, I see how this was digitized really strangely once I'm you know, tagging it. And ah, I see what Alan was talking about, how OpenStreetMap is a database. And there's a reason why I can't see absolutely everything that I have, um, that, that I have di drawn on this map in the default rendering, but I have some control over that. And that's really neat to see. There's been a new round of going in and correcting and editing all of the um, things that were originally added, which is fantastic because I feel pretty committed to going back when this is all done and doing my best to fix up whatever they've done. Um, be a good community citizen. Um, so I'm glad that they're doing a little bit more of that. Um, and uh, yeah, so just a few preliminary conclusion points. I think we really improved the map. Um, even if the things aren't tagged perfectly right now, um, we did vastly expand what's on the map in a way that um, was very democratic and um, very genuine um, on the part of the students who are contributing to it. Um, I think we also brought some diversity to OpenStreetMap. Um, 
I think my, my class is more, uh, represents a broader cross section of the general population than OpenStreetMap does. Um, and I know that uh, we remain pretty challenged in this endeavor to try and teach OpenStreetMap to geographers. Um, we're still challenged with how to reconcile OpenStreetMap with other standards and approaches. Um, still very challenged with how to teach um, OpenStreetMap to students with a, a huge diversity, a huge range of backgrounds and skills, some of whom find, find ID just about what they can handle and some of whom um, feel like they'd like to have a much more precise digitizing tools. Um, and still challenged with how to introduce uh, newbies to the OpenStreetMap community in a way that won't be too jarring, um, given that they don't know the conventions and no amount, no amount of explaining it to them um, is going to make it perfectly clear. So to be continued, I think. Um, I, was, I wanna also thank my co-teacher, Damon Burgett. Um, Beth Schechter came in and demonstrated field papers for us and participated in our lab exercise. John Firebow also uh, participated in our lab exercise and was phenomenal with um, going around the room and helping students figure out how to tag things and how to think about things in an OSME way um, and how to work with ID. Um, and uh, so just a few outtakes. This is the, the uh, 360 degrees of our classroom. There's me and Beth up there on the left. Um, these are all the same image. And uh, you can kind of see John right there. This is just his head. Um, this is my class. There's a better picture of John hanging out. Uh, there's Beth. There's Alan. There they are being so attentive as usual. And uh, <laughs> so drawing, a little drawing, a little drawing by Damon. Um, and thank you so much. We look forward to.